Good morning, Crossway. So good to be with you this morning. So glad you could join us for our service. Thank you so much to the Ritter family for reading that important scripture that we're about to dive into here in a minute. But before I do that, I want to just kind of give you a thought or put out a phrase and see where your mind goes with it. If I were to say to you, this is the way, what comes to your mind? Well, if you own Disney Plus, if you're using it, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a line, this is the way, that's part of the show called The Mandalorian. And if you don't have Disney Plus, and you're probably thinking, like, what in the world are you talking about? So let me explain. The Mandalorian is a show on Disney Plus that follows sort of the life of this guy who's a bounty hunter who exists in this Star Wars universe. And I'm bringing that up because there's a, that's a favorite show of mine, first of all, but also because there's three particular scenes that I would love to reference this morning to kind of help us understand the scripture that we're about to look at. One of the scenes is very important for us because it reminds us that when we're trying to obey Christ, there's certain things that we have to remember. So like we have to remember to care for the weak. The scripture talks about that. Another scene in the show talks about this idea of obeying this code, right? This way that, that the Mandalorians follow. That's something that's actually similar to what comes up in the scripture. And the last scene we'll talk about, talks about or focuses on this idea of having a daily habit of focusing on we instead of just me. So we'll get to there in a minute, but before we do that, let's go ahead and invite you, just like we do at Crossway, to put your hands up like this and to pray with us so we can ask the Holy Spirit to join us this morning and help us understand his word. So let's do that. Father, we thank you and praise you for this morning. We pray, God, that you would help us to not just read your word this morning and not even just understand it, but to actually learn how to apply it in our life. I believe for such a time as this, this word is so important for us. And I pray, God, that you would use me and use us this morning to, again, dive into your word, understand it, and apply it. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we talk any more about the Mandalorian, I want to look at the scripture and kind of get your, uh, your mind going in the right direction. So the first scripture is going to be Romans chapter 15. It's really just one whole passage from verses 1 to 6. But verses 1 and 2 reads like this. We who are strong are to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves, not please just ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbor for their good and to build them up. Why am I reading that? Why are we going to focus on that? Because that verse tells us something that's very applicable to us, to us today. And as we ponder on that verse, I want to just talk about the Mandalorian real quick, because if we get to know this character and one particular scene in this show, I think it'll help us understand the scripture. So the Mandalorian, right? That, he's a guy who lives on a planet called Mandalore. And so he's a Mandalorian and he's a bounty hunter. And his job is to go ahead and try to find someone who's in one place and bring them to another place. That's what people pay him to do. And so as he's going about his life and going about his business, he has all these responsibilities he has to do. One of his responsibilities is finding people, bringing them from one place to another, but it's also making sure that usually they stay alive, right? So he has to care for them. So why am I bringing that up? Because during the course of one of the scenes in this show, the Mandalorian is going about his daily routine, just like you and I would go about our daily routines. And he's dealing with whatever he has to deal with, flying somewhere and I'm sure financial expenses, whatever it is that he's dealing with. And as he goes about his daily routine, he, he quickly finds that his daily routine comes into conflict with what he really believes, this idea of the way which his people follow. So here's what I'm talking about. The scene opens and he's just dropped off one of, these th one of these people that he's supposed to deliver, right? But in this particular case, the person is actually a little baby Yoda. <laughs> this is a real popular character right now. So the Mandalorian delivers him to where he's supposed to you know, go. No big deal. It's his daily usual routine. It's what he does all the time. But here's the problem. As he does that, he realizes bringing this child, right, he's called the child, to this place where he's supposed to be actually goes against one of his core beliefs, which is that if you find an orphan child or what he calls a foundling, you can't just leave it there unmonitored. You have to actually care for it yourself or you have to go ahead and find a proper family for it. So that's the conundrum he finds himself in. So let's review. He's doing it through his daily routine. He's carrying his usual plate of responsibilities. He's trying to just do his job. And then finally, he realizes, I can't just do that. It runs into conflict with what the way tells me to do. I want you to be thinking about that for this reason. 
You and I exist every day trying to accomplish our daily routines, right? Whether it's parenting, running our home, running our business, whatever it is that we're doing, we're just trying to get by. Especially in this code of this crazy time that we're going through, we're just trying to do the best that we can. And because we know who Jesus is, who is the way, right, the truth and the life, we're just trying to live our lives for him. And as we live each day, we hope to kind of follow his way and grow more and more into maturity. The problem exists when we go through that routine and we come across someone who's also a believer who we can tell pretty quickly is struggling with one particular truth or some sort of lifestyle choice or something that we know is not the way. It's not the way that we're supposed to live our life. And that could be anyone. That could be your son. That could be your daughter. That could be a coworker. That could be anyone that is in your usual sphere of influence and in life. It could be the way that they um, espouse their belief on social media. It could be the way that they're ha habitually talking. It could be the way that they dress. It could be just about anything. And you know, because you know the word of God, that their choice is not quite lining up with what God would have them do. This scripture talks about those two people, those that one who knows the way and the one who's struggling with the way as the strong and the weak. So let's read it again. It says, he who are, we who are strong are to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves, right? It says that in the first verse. Why is Paul pointing this out? Well, I believe he's pointing this out because of one basic reason. He knows that's not our inclination, Let's go back to the Mandalorian. His name is Mando. Mando goes about his daily business. He, has, he, goes, he delivers the child. And after he delivers the child, he goes, wait a minute. I don't think that was right. You can see in his character and in his body language that that's a conflict for him. And he knows that he has to make a choice now. He either has to choose to care and do something about what just happened. Or he could choose to just cancel out and not even worry about it, put it out of his mind. Now, have you been there before? Have you listened to a conversation with someone and you know they're a believer and you're like, mm, they're off on that? Or have you seen someone in your life, maybe like I said, a family member or friend, and they're involved in a habit or involved in the way that they talk and you know that's not quite lining up with what God wants? In that situation, you're the strong one. Your faith is strong and theirs is weak and you have a choice to make. You could just go about your life and go like, I've got plenty to carry on my own, trying to raise my family, doing whatever it is I have to do, go to college, you know, go to work. Or you could do what this scripture here is suggesting. You could stop and understand that this scripture is trying to get us to do two things, to care and then to do something. First, we have to consider what we're willing to care about before we can consider what we're willing to do about it. So here's what I mean. Look at the first word in this verse. Well, the first word I've highlighted anyway, it's the word bear. If you look it up in its original language, the word bear just means to carry. And that makes perfect sense, right? Because as we're carrying our responsibilities every day, Paul is telling us, hey, when you come across someone who's weaker, in you and you're weaker than you in your faith, you have to be willing to look at them and consider, do I need to help them carry their responsibility as well? Because they're obviously not carrying it well. And then the second part I want you to notice in this verse is where it says, for their good to build them up. That's a great indication as to our heart and where our heart is. In other words, what I think Paul is telling us is that you who are strong, when you notice someone who's weak in their faith, you need to check your heart. You need to not go to where it might naturally go and criticize and be critical. I can't believe they're wearing that. I can't believe they're saying that. Like, oh my gosh, did you see the last thing that, that, that you know, they chose to do? Like, that's where our heart will naturally go to criticism. But the way is not that way, right? The way is to actually lean in and to say like, man, the, God's word is saying for me to care for that person and to be willing to do something about that circumstance. So that's what verse one is telling us and verse two. So if we keep moving forward, we'll see that the verse goes on. And verse three reads like this. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. That's a mouthful. Did you even understand that verse? When I first read it, I was like, what? what are you talking about? So I did some research on that verse. Here's the thing. We have to consider first in verse one what we might be willing to do and have a posture of care. That should lead us to prayer. As we come across people who have weaker faith in us, we should be praying for them. Before we say anything to them or try to correct in any way, shape, or form, we should be praying. Then this next verse is saying that we should take it even a higher level. 
So let's go back to Mando. What did Mando do, right? He was in this conflict. He didn't know what to do about the fact that what he just did, dropping off this kid, went against his belief system. Once he thought about it, he knew that he had to care. He had to do something. The next scene falls out. It's a classic, kind of almost like an old Western scene. He busts into this building, and he goes to free this child. He shoots up the place, and he kind of gets the child, right? It's awesome. So it's fun. It's entertaining. But if you think about it, what he's actually done is he's risked everything. He's risked his livelihood, he's risked his very life to do what's right, to follow what he would call the way. You and I are going to be in similar circumstances where once we see someone who's weaker in their faith and once we've leaned in and said, God, would you help me to care for them and not criticize them? We're also going to be at a point where we have to make a choice. What, will we be, what would we be willing to do about it? Because the reality is, Scripture is pretty clear. If we are going the way of maturity, then the way of maturity is caring and not canceling out. The way of maturity is caring and not just criticizing. The way of maturity is making time for them in our life. And I love the two things I want to point out in this particular verse. Number one, notice that he, he quotes an Old Testament verse. It's located in Psalm 69, 9. And it's the psalmist saying this, God, I'm so dedicated to you. I'm so focused and devoted to you that I'm even willing to take on the weakness, the problems, or the sin of others. So that quote is actually someone directing their, their, their um, thoughts to God. I'm willing to take on the insults of others is what he's saying. And then he says, the reason I'm using that, right, is because it's just like Christ. Think about that for a second. If there's anything you know about Jesus, you know that he was all about caring for others. That's why he came to earth in the first place, to care for others. And I love what it says in the, in the passage. It says, for even Christ did not please himself. I looked up that word too, the word please. And I like the original meaning more than what they have, actually have in this version. It should read kind of like this, for even Christ did not accommodate himself. The word please means to accommodate. So what comes to your mind when you think about accommodate? For me, I think about accommodations. So let's say I rent a hotel room or at a resort. I get the hotel room, right? When I swipe my credit card, I get to use the pool and other amenities. And so I'm going to have fun using my, you know, uh, my credit card. I'm going to be accommodated by the place that owns the resort or the hotel. What it doesn't mean, however, is that I now have the right to do whatever I want, whenever I want. I can't just be like, well, tonight I'm going to go stay in that room, and then the other night I'm going to go stay in that room. And when I go to the pool, I want everybody cleared out, you know, because I, it's my pool, it's my time. Like, I can't do that, right? So I love the fact that the scripture is saying that Christ accommodated, uh, no, not himself, but others. What did that look like in Jesus' life? Well, it looked like this. He came down, right, and made space for us. That's what accommodation means. It means to make a space for someone. He made space for us in his life. He came down to earth. He walked with us. He talked with us. He was willing to actually hear us out, right? One of the big knocks on him by those religious leaders was that he hung out with sinners. That's what he did. And that's what Paul is trying to point us to in this scripture, that when we actually decide, okay, I'm the mature one and I see that this person is struggling, first we have to lean in with care, with love, and with compassion. Then on top of that, we have to decide, what am I willing to do? What you're willing to do is going to be specific to every single one of us. It's going to be a little bit different. But basically, it's going to be this. You're going to be willing to make space, make space for some. Have them come over to your table. Invite them over for dinner. Maybe go out for them with, to, uh, with them with coffee. You're going to make space for them in your life. Because again, we're talking about people who are already kind of the, part, um, part of the sphere of our life and they're, they're in our sphere of influence. So I'm not talking about a stranger on the bus or somebody you see somewhere and you're like, hey, you're wrong. You shouldn't be saying that. That's not what I'm saying at all, okay? What I'm saying is what the scripture is saying that when we see somebody who's struggling with something, we should be willing to care for them first and then lean in in relationship with them and make them a part of our life. As opposed to what? As opposed to what, unfortunately, so many of us have been doing lately with difficult things in our life, like different opinions on COVID-19, different opinions on uh, how we approach this whole racial you know, um, um, reconciliation in our country and different difficulties in our life. We already have our, uh, plenty of issues in our regular everyday life to deal with. Like I said, raising our family and doing whatever we can to be a blessing to others. Now, during this time, it's a little crazier, right? We have to decide, what are we going to do? How are we going to lean in to someone? 
So I want to make it clear what we're seeing so far in our scripture. We're seeing that we have to care if we want the way of maturity. We're saying that we have to lean in. And I want to make it clear what we're not saying. We're not saying that because we're trying to please others, that we're just letting them run roughshod all over our life. That's not what I'm saying at all. That is not the way of Christ. Christ was the first one to let people know, like, hey, you're trying to stone this lady for sinning? Well, let me ask you, who was the first one, you know, who, which, which among you don't have sin? Right? He was ready to stand up at the right time. And he even told the lady, now that I've you know, made space for you and, and given you forgiveness, go and sin no more. So it's a very good balance there that Christ is trying to teach us and Paul is pointing us toward. The way of maturity is caring for others and not, not just uh, complaining or, or, or criticizing them. That's the way we're supposed to be going. So let's move on to the next verse. I love the next verse because it goes on and it says this. It says that everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. In other words, here's what he's saying. He's saying that our hope should come from scripture. You could just basically say that one verse like that. Our hope should come from scripture. Why is Paul saying this at this point? Why is he saying that you should be leaning to Scripture for a sense of hope and for a sense of endurance? Here's why. Because he knows that if you do the two things he's suggesting in verse 1, care, lean in, accommodate others, that you're not entering into a relationship and you're entering into something that actually takes time. Because if you're going to try to help and try to be benevolent and, and be a, a mentor of sorts to someone who needs to kind of come along in their faith, that's not going to happen over one time in coffee. That's not going to happen over one dinner date. That's going to happen over time. Conversation after conversation, serving with them, talking with them, laughing with them, right? Disagreeing with them, maybe debating with them. That's going to happen over time. And what Paul is saying here is that when that happens, we have to depend on Scripture and find hope from Scripture, not just from the way this person is responding to us. So I'll give you two examples. Example number one. There's a lady, her name, I'm going to call her Diane. And she's working, or she always works, and she's just doing her job, which is actually helping out the president of the company. And as she helps the president of the company, she needs to know everything that kind of happens in his life, because that's what she does for a living. She sets his schedule, she sets his flights, she does all kinds of things for the president of the company. Well, as she's doing her job, one day, this guy named Jack comes in, and he's like, hey, uh, where's the president? I need to talk to him. And she's like, well, okay, well, if you make an appointment, maybe we can talk about, you know, talking to the president, but I don't even know who you are, your name, so you'll have to slow down a little bit. He's like, oh, what are you talking about? Me and him go way back. I don't need you. Just tell me where he's at, you know? And he's kind of bullying her, right? Kind of coming in and kind of throwing his weight around. So she doesn't know Jack at all, and she doesn't know the exact circumstance. Here's one thing that she does know. She doesn't like Jack, right? There's something about his demeanor, his bravado, his sort of dismissiveness that she really does not like. And so she has a choice to make. And it just so happens that Diane is a believer. So she decides, I'm not going to respond, right, the way my flesh is telling me to, which is to criticize this guy and let him know what I think about his opinion and the way he does things. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to lean into Scripture and I'm going to do what God has called me to do. So she had learned enough about Scripture throughout the years that she knows she had to lean in and kind of see, okay, what's this guy about? So she took the first opportunity she could, and the lady invited her to a party where she knew he was going to be, and she was like, okay, I'm not going to ignore him. I'm not going to cancel him out of my life. I'm going to go ahead and go to this party and kind of engage this guy and get to know him. So sure enough, she goes to the party, she gets to know him, and she realizes, oh, there's a lot of things going on in his life. He had just lost someone in his life. He's going through some difficulties. So it kind of made sense that he was, you know, a little rough around the edges. So she decided to kind of befriend him and talk to him. And sure enough, they kind of got along that night, and one conversation led to another. And believe it or not, Jack and Diane, as I call them, they're married today, and they are at Crossway Church. That's crazy, right? What can happen when you lean into a circumstance where you don't necessarily like the person at first, you kind of see that they're kind of weak in their faith and kind of rough around the edges. When you lean in, it could lead to something beautiful. You never know what God has. But let's be honest this morning. It's not always going to work out that way. Someone you disagree with is not always going to be someone that you end up marrying or falling in love with, right? More times than not, as you're pouring into them, they may not change. And they might still stick to their opinions or stick to their negative lifestyle or whatever it is that they're going through that doesn't line up with Scripture. And that's why it's so important that we understand what the Scripture is saying, that what we have to do is be leaning and relying on God's truth, not our truth. Let me say that again. 
The way of maturity is motivated by God's truth, not your truth. What do I mean by your truth? Your truth is kind of this thing that we hear a lot nowadays, right? My experience and what I've gone through, that's my truth. The reality is people treat me a certain way or I act a certain way or, or my experience is this way. And that's very true. And we have to lean into people's stories and listen to their stories and be compassionate, like we said earlier. But at the end of the day, we have to rely on God's word in terms of what our actions, what our choices are going to be, not our experience and not our truth. So the way of maturity is definitely motivated by God's truth and not just our truth. And as we continue to read this scripture, we're going to see why God is leading us in this direction and that there is somewhere that, that we're going. So I haven't talked about Mando for a while, right? Why do I want to talk about Mando again? But there's another scene in the show that again hits this point so clearly. That scene is when the Mandalorian Mando is kind of backed up against the wall. He's trying to protect the baby, right? And he's shooting at people and he finds himself in a really bad place. And all of a sudden, a whole bunch of other Mandalorians come out of the woodwork and shoot all the bad guys and help him to escape. That's a cool scene. And you might be thinking, what does that have to do with anything? Here's what it has to do. The Mandalorian stuck to their code, right? They didn't know what the circumstance was. They didn't know if Mando deserved to be shot or anything. All they knew is that it wasn't, they were going to place their actions not on him, but on the truth that they knew on the way, right? That's a great reminder for us that that's what God is calling us to. When we're trying to engage what we consider a weaker brother or sister, in terms of their strength, in terms of their, in terms of their faith, not in terms of their value, I'm not at all saying that we have certain people that we reach out to, certain people that we don't, by no means. What I'm trying to do is keep it in context of what Paul was saying, that when we find somebody in our sphere of influence who's struggling to grow up in their maturity in Christ, who's not lined up quite with what Christ, quite with what Christ wants, we should consider caring, we should consider leaning in, we should consider being motivated by what Scripture is telling us to do, and not necessarily how they respond to us, Right? So let's keep moving forward in the scripture. You guys, two more very important things to say. Verse five says this. So now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ had. Wow, that's important. I want to say that again. There's two things. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement. Where do we just hear that? In the verse before. He says that the scriptures give us endurance and encouragement. So he's acknowledging here that we read the scriptures because we have to receive something. Something we're not naturally going to have in this interaction with this person, right? Endurance and encouragement. And not only can we receive that, look at the next thing he says that we can receive. He says that the one who gives you endurance and encouragement will also give you the same attitude and mind of Christ. This is a big deal. This is a huge deal. Because if you know anything about the writings of Paul, he uses the same exact phrasing in another book to other believers at this time. In the book of Philippians, it says something. And I don't have it on your screen on purpose. I'm just going to emphasize the beginning part and the end part of a whole section of where he's talking to the Philippian church, Paul is. Because he uses the same language. It's Philippians chapter 2. And in verse 5, it just starts with this very basic. He says, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Right? Then he goes on to talk. And at the end of that section in verse 8, he says, Christ Jesus humbled himself. So that's what he's talking about here in verse 5. He says that the God who gave you endurance and encouragement through his word, you got to make sure that you're also asking him to receive and he, that he would give you the sense of the same attitude of Christ, which is called humility. Humility. What a huge and important word. We have to get this cross. We have to understand that what Paul is saying here is that if you try to engage in this relationship where you're caring for someone, you're genuinely concerned about their faith and them maturing, and you're trying to lean in and care, and you have to lean on the Word of God because it's taken out longer than you thought, that you have to make a daily decision to ask God to give you something that you don't naturally have, which is this idea and this character trait of maturity. Oh, not maturity, sorry, but humility, right? Humility is so huge. So here's what I'd love for you guys to do right now, right where you are. If you have another device in the house that's not the one you're watching me on now, grab that device and open up whatever your um, internet web browser is. Go to Google and type in simply the word humility. Once you hit enter, I'd love for you to click on the next option, which is images. So in other words, I'd love for you to go to Google and ask Google, show me images of humility. Here's what you're going to see. 
you're going to see, amongst other things, the first like one to two pictures, you're going to see a chart, a black and white chart that says the characteristics or lists the characteristics of pride and humility side by side. And I'm not going to read them all. That's why I want you to look it up on your own. But I'm going to emphasize a couple of them that are on there. In other words, what it's saying in this thing, this very basic, easy to access thing about pride, is that pride produces self-righteousness, overly criticalness, uh, finding fault in others and looking down on people amongst a bunch of other things that it says there. That's what pride leads us to. And that's what we all naturally tend to lean toward, especially in the context of coming across someone who we feel is not quite right in terms of their maturity level, in terms of them living or talking or having a, a certain mindset that lines up with scripture. We will be naturally prone to kind of look down on it and be self-righteous. So let's not be prideful. In fact, let's lean in every day and ask God through his Holy Spirit to give us humility. Because look what it says on the other part of that chart. It says humility then is seen by being compassionate, forgiving, finding the best in others, serving others. That's what humility looks like. And if you're familiar with those words, you know that humility sure sounds a lot like Jesus. Sure sounds a lot like Christ. That is what uh, this verse is trying to push us toward away from our natural way of being prideful, but toward being humble. So in other words, the way of the humble or the way of maturity is humble and not proud. We got to understand that we have to actually every day be asking for that. And I love once again how this matches up with one of the scenes in The Mandalorian. It's a beautiful scene already halfway through the season, and he has an opportunity to sort of give the child over to a family that would take care of it. And not only that, but the lady who would take care of him, actually, he starts to be attracted to her. And he's thinking, like, maybe I can settle down and I can just help raise this child and I can marry this lady, right? He's considering it. And as he's having this scene with this woman, she comes up close and she starts to take off his helmet. If you don't know the Mandalorian, he actually wears a suit of armor and he has a helmet on. But then again, here comes his code. Here comes his belief system. One of the other things that Mandalorians believe is that they never take off their helmet. And you might be asking why and what does that have to do with Scripture? Here's what it has to do with Scripture. When Mandalorians refuse to take off their helmet, what they're saying is, I'm going to focus each day on the idea of we and not focus on the idea of me. Let me say that again. I'm going to focus on the idea of we, the group of us, the Mandalorians, or in our case, Christ followers, brothers and sisters in Christ, not focus on me. Do you see how that's very much like humility? Not focusing on me, on my preferences, on what I want, but thinking of myself less and focusing on what you need. So I love what C.S. Lewis says about humility. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. In other words, it's not thinking about what you want and what you need and what you desire all the time. It's being humble by worrying about what others are going through, especially in the context of trying to bring a younger brother or sister along in some place that they struggle. So for the sake of recap, let's go over this again. If we are going to be mature and walk in the way of maturity, we need to lean in and care for others. We need to be willing to sacrifice for them and make a space for them and accommodate what they're going through. We need to rely on scripture because they may not grow in the, in the way that we hope that they grow. And then finally, we need to be focused on every day being humble and receiving from God because we don't conjure it up ourselves, this attitude of humility. And all of this leads to the one last thing which we'll close with this morning. Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, why to all this? Paul answers the question, why? So that with one mind and one voice, we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the kicker. There's the really big answer to the question, why? Why do we want to be mature? Why do we pursue maturity? Why would we, be, would we be willing to consider spending time with someone that we don't necessarily see eye to eye with, that we're going to try to you know, be inconvenienced for a time and giving them our time and, and, our, and uh, you know, our energy? Because of this, because when we do that, we hope that it will end up in this reality, what it says in verse 6, that with one mind and one voice, we may glorify God the Father. What a beautiful picture that would be. 
that one day this person you didn't get along with or you didn't really see eye to eye with, that God would use you in your benevolence and your caring for them and your invested time with them for both of you guys to say, hey, we're still different and we still sit on see eye to eye and everything, but we come together for the name of Christ to serve others, to bless others, to do something that is, again, following the way. The way of maturity is the way to Christ. And that's the ultimate answer to the question why. Why do we pursue maturity? Because not because we want to be right or win the argument, but because we want to win the person. We want to combine with them and join forces with them and reach the world for Christ. Why do we seek maturity? It's because our desire is to be motivated by love and expressing that in humility. And we do that so that when we do that, they get a taste, just a taste of what Christ was really like and who he really is still today. When we win that person, when we actually not focus on the argument or our disagreement and we invest in relational time with them, then what we become is more like Christ and we get them to kind of draw closer to Christ as well. I can't overemphasize how important these principles are for us nowadays as we're going through this COVID experience still, as we're still not quite through this whole, you know, um, change in in our culture and how we're going to deal with each other as race, as we're going through so many common everyday responsibilities. It is our way, the way of the mature, to be like Christ and do things His way. Lean in, care for others, be praying for them, not canceling them out, not being critical of them relying on God's word to give us the energy and strength we need to continue to to just like cultivate that relationship and then be asking every day for the Holy Spirit to fill us with this sense of humility. When we do that, then it's amazing what can happen and what God can do through all of us. Amen. So Crossway, I hope that this will speak truth to you. I hope they will encourage you to remind you of how you should be interacting with those around you. And I hope that you will be blessed this morning. So let me give you a benediction before we dismiss this morning. And let me pray for you after the benediction. So Crossway, now go ahead and live your life for the glory of God the Father, resting in the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthened by the Holy Spirit, and reminding yourself you're a city on a hill and a light to South Florida. Go in peace. Let me pray for you. Father, we pray that you would help us to absorb your word, to live it out, to love one another, to be humble every day, that we would draw people to yourself and show the world this is the way to reconciliation. This is the way to peace and love by falling before you and allowing your word to guide us, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, Crossway.